<laughs> well, hello and uh, welcome to SARS-CoV-2, Science, Theology, and Ethics. If you don't know me, I'm Ted Peters, and I'm here with my friend, colleague, and expert, Martinez Hewlett. I'm going to call him Marty. Please do. So we are uh, fortunate because uh, there are a few people in the world who are going to understand uh, not just the science, but also the theological and ethical issues better than Marty. Uh, Marty is a professor emeritus uh, from the University of Arizona Department of Molecular Biology, currently at the University of New Mexico in Taos, where he is a research scholar. And what's extremely relevant for our discussion here today is that he has been a co-author for a number of years of a textbook called Basic Virology, widely used in medical schools uh, around the country. Marty, are you going to have to revise that textbook now in light of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2? Yes, we have a new, a new edition coming out in the spring, uh, uh, the fourth edition, and we have a big section in it on SARS and COVID-19. Well, I can, I can imagine. Uh, I mean, nobody's going to want to buy the old editions of this textbook. They only want to buy the new one, right? right? Well, Marty and I um, have been partners in crime for more than two decades now, having worked together on the Science and Religion course program. And then in the late 1990s, we teamed up to do a series of serious studies on the evolution controversy, and that included retrieving uh, what Charles Darwin had actually said in light of the controversies over creationism, intelligent design, theistic evolution, and such. And I think we wrap that up about the 200th birthday of uh, Charles Darwin in 2009. And uh, we've been waiting for the next uh, emergency, I guess. <laughs> before we, here we are. <laughs> oh, it's here. It's here already, already. Well, uh, I think that uh, given our little uh, trifecta of theology, uh, science, theology, and ethics, uh, Marty, why don't, you, why don't you get us going, start with the science, and then we'll sort of roll into the ethics and uh, get up the share screen. Beautiful, Ted. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to uh, go through a, a bit of a PowerPoint for you uh, to kind of go through what I'm calling a, a primer, if you will, on the SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you know, a, a year ago, I think most people outside of virology uh, had never heard the word coronavirus, I think, in their lives. And now it's, of course, on every tongue, quite literally and figuratively in the world. And it's something that has dominated our lives. So I want to talk a little bit about the virus, but really about the pandemic and, and how this virus has, uh, has made it worldwide. Um, uh, leave it open for questions as, as Ted uh, comes up with them so we can have a bit of a discussion around some of these issues. This is an artist's rendering of a typical coronavirus and it gets its name, that group family of viruses from the array of, of proteins that are around the surface that are called the spike glycoproteins. And they're, they're gonna be the focus of our attention, especially as we start thinking about vaccines towards the end of our time together here. Uh, the coronaviruses were discovered in the 1960s and they are a vast family. They infect many, many different animals, but but the ones that infect humans are, are quite literally these seven uh, viruses. Uh, four of them are inconsequential in the sense that they, they cause only the common cold. But three of them cause quite serious disease. The first we encountered was the one we now call SARS-CoV-1, which originally was called SARS, which was an outbreak that started in China uh, back in the early parts of this century, around 2004, and uh, was relatively severe, became pandemic, but not in the sense that we're now experiencing. This one 
was much more self-limited and virtually disappeared. The second one that appeared on the scene was this one, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome related coronavirus, which is now called MERS-CoV. Uh, it's a virus of camels that actually only infects people who work directly with the animals. It doesn't go person to person and is a quite severe infection. But the one our attention is focused on now, of course, for the last literally over a year, uh, is the one called SARS-CoV-2, uh, which is the cause of COVID-19. The origin story of this pandemic starts in Wuhan, China. I think most of us, I, I assume Ted might have, he's been to China more than I have. I've never been there. Uh, but Wuhan was not a, a, a name of a place in China that rolled off the tongue <laughs> easily for most people in the world. And here it is, I have it circled on the map of China. It's due, due uh, west of Shanghai, inland, uh, south of Beijing. Beijing's up here and, and north of Hong Kong, just to give you an orientation, sort of in the heart of the country. It's quite a large city, very uh, industrial center, a very large city in terms of transportation with the world, population of about 11 million people. Uh, on December 31st of last year, of 2019, I should say, um, a little over a year ago, the World Health Organization was informed by the, their China office that there were 44 cases of a pneumonia-like illness of unknown etiology, of unknown cause, that appeared in the hospitals in Wuhan. Um, there, they, these cases had started early on in, in December. And some of them were uh, quite fatal. 11 were severely ill at the time of this report. Several of those people did die. Uh, the cases were linked to uh, a wet market in Wuhan, one of the places where live animals are sold, butchered on the spot. Sometimes exotic animals are brought into these places, uh, but some were not. Um, and so our, our, our general understanding of how viruses like this get into the human population are called spillover events. When, when humans encounter the wild animals that are the host for these viruses, in many cases, they're bats. In this particular case, the viruses that came out were from a bat uh, originally, maybe with an intermediate host like the pangolin or something like that. Certainly the earlier SARS-CoV-1 SARS -CoV now had come from a bat through a civet cat. But in any case, got in by what's called zoonotic transmission into people, and then from there into community spread. And then the rest we know we'll talk about as it, as it went worldwide because Marty, of- uh, yeah. Marty, I have a uh, very troubled Republican friend mm. who insists on calling this the China virus. The China virus. Do you recommend yeah. that uh, we call it that or not? It, it used to be that we named viruses after locales, uh, and and uh, that that was common 50, 40, even 20, 30 years ago. But it, it becomes uh, confusing because the virus didn't necessarily come from China. Because it came out of a bat, the bat could have come from anywhere. The bats migrate up and down the Asian uh, continent. And so you could have easily have called it the Vietnamese vi uh, virus for that matter. We don't know where the bats actually got it. So that, that makes it a little, uh, little weird. And it also is pejorative. The official name of it is uh, SARS-CoV-2, Se Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Virus, uh, Coronavirus 2. Um, that's the name we've all agreed on. So China virus is pejorative, I believe. All right, thanks. You're welcome. Um, so here, here's the, 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 the report that was put out by the Chinese uh, Center for Disease Control uh, early, la early last year, uh, showing a list of a, a few of those patients that were identified in this first characterization, a novel coronavirus. And uh, amazingly, they were able to come to a very rapid identification of the virus. They initially called it 2019-N-CoV for novel coronavirus, but it, it was formally named by WHO SARS-CoV-2, and the disease it calls, causes is called 
COVID-19, coronavirus infectious disease 19, all because the original cases were identified in December of 2019. Uh, very rapidly, they were able to identify by, by sequence of the genome, uh, the origin of this virus and come up with what is uh, like a, a phylogenetic tree, if you will. Uh, and this is a very complicated figure, but I just wanna point out that um, many of these coronaviruses are bat viruses, as you see here. Here's a, a clade of bat viruses. Here's another clade. Some of them are in other animals. Here are the human viruses. These are the ones that uh, were the original SARS clade uh, from earlier this century. Here's that MERS virus I talked about. And here's our pandemic virus, what was in this paper called 2019 NCoV. Now, are each of those red entries a separate mutation or uh, just why is there more than one entry there? Because these, uh, thanks, that's a good question, Ted. These are just uh, sequence studies from uh, those different patients in the Wuhan hospital. Oh, thank you. All right, got it. Initially, right. Sampling from those patients, right? Now, amazingly, the, the scientists in China were able to come up with a genomic sequence very rapidly, thanks to our technology for sequencing, very different from even 20 years ago. Very quickly, we were able to get uh, a genomic sequence of this. This paper was published in Lancet in February. Here's some early key dates in the pandemic. Uh, this is the date, December 31st, when the WHO was alerted to those cases in Wuhan. Um, another key date, by the 9th, uh, it was clear that it was an unknown, a newly identified coronavirus, previously unknown, by WHO. They declared that outbreak being caused by that. Um, on the 12th of January, uh, the genome sequence was initially released by the science scientist in China. And the um, first case in the United States was identified on January 21st of last year. Uh, a person who had traveled from, uh, uh, from uh, Wuhan to Washington state. Um, the first death outside of Wuhan was on the 23rd of January. And on that same date, the scientists in China released the complete genome to the internet. So this means that every scientist in the world had access to the genomic sequence. And that's very key to the development of what happens in terms of vaccination. Okay, um, because the NIH then on the next day started the process of working on a vaccine along with the companies that we've now heard all about like Moderna and Pfizer. But the process actually began at NIH in, in the vaccine program at uh, NIAID. Human-to-human uh, -human transmission in the U.S. was uh, sort of was actually became clear by the, by the end of that month. And in the United States, there's some key dates. Um, this is that first case, a person who traveled to Washington state from Wuhan was the first identified case of COVID-19 in the US. Um, first person to person spread was by the end of the month uh, in January of last year. Uh, first death was in February. Uh, in the United States, a 54-year-old male in Seattle. Um, the U.S. declared this a pandemic, a COVID pandemic, by the third of by the 13th of March. Okay. Um, and do you mind just reminding us what's the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? Sure. An, an epidemic is a widespread but local outbreak of an infection that is not normally seen in that particular locale. So for instance, we'll have epidemics of measles in various locales, but they're locally isolated. A pandemic is literally a worldwide epidemic. It, it, is, a, it is epidemic status in multiple countries at the same time. Okay. Okay. Uh, interestingly, this date, 316 of last year, was the date that the trial for a vaccine designated mRNA 1273 was started in Seattle. And that is the vaccine that is now the Moderna vaccine. Oh, wow. 
So that was the beginning of the phase one trial for Moderna when the first people were vaccinated in phase one. So you can see that wow, in this- That is so phase, rapid, so fast. It, it is fast, it is fast. And, and the reason that it's going so fast, and we'll cover this a little bit later, is because of this mRNA platform. Uh -huh. now, now, most people think this platform was invented for this vaccine, but it was a couple of decades before this that this platform was developed for other reasons, for vaccines, but also for cancer treatment. So it was as though you had this on the shelf. And as soon as you got the information, you plugged it into this and you could immediately start giving it in human trials because all of the setup work had been done in the preceding decade. Uh, so that's an important date, 316. Yeah. All right, the, the virus itself infects our, our cells by attaching to a protein that's on the surface called the ACE2 protein, the angiotensin converting enzyme. And it's a very common enzyme on the surface of our cells, especially in the lung epithelial tract. And it gains entry to the cell and as all viruses do, then takes over the cell and converts it into a factory for producing uh, more virus. And this is a complicated slide. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but just to remind you that once it's inside the cell, it's got to go through a variety of processing to ultimately produce all the proteins that are necessary to construct the virus particle. One of those being this spike protein, which we'll come back to uh, in a bit. Okay, so that's, that's its life cycle, if you will. Uh, we'll get more into what happens pathogenically here and why this is, uh, has turned out to be such a severe infection uh, in a moment. Uh, first, let's talk about spread. There's a number that, that epidemiologists use called the R0 or R0. It's the basic rep reproduction number. What it means literally is if one person is infected and is shedding virus, how many other people on average does that person then infect? And this just shows a variety of different viruses all the way from measles, which is one of the most contagious viruses we know. It has an R0 of 16, all the way down to this camel virus, MERS, which basically is rarely transmitted to another person. So its R0 is less than one. Our COVID-19 virus has an R0 of 2.5. Compare that to influenza or seasonal influenza, a little bit more infectious than seasonal influenza, okay? Uh, but let's compare it to mortality. So here's a chart that shows you the r naught down here, the basic reproduction number of a number of viruses and some bacterial diseases, along with mortality rate. Mortality rate is the percent of people who get, in, who get infected who die, okay? And so some things are quite deadly. Rabies, for instance, is untreated, uh, almost 100% um, mortality. HIV is over 80% mortality. Ebola is, depending on the strain, up around 40% mortality. Some, some bird flus, if they get into humans, are quite, quite deadly. Uh, other viruses, like our seasonal influenzas, are quite low, and that's this part of the chart is, is blown up over here so you can see it. Here's seasonal influenza, which has an R0 of around 1.5 and a very low mortality rate in the 0.1% range. Here's treated HIV, very low mortality. Here's COVID-19, up here above 3%. So you can see it is probably 10 times more deadly, if you will, in terms of mortality rate than um, influenza, than seasonal influenza. And that belies the, the idea of people going around saying, well, it's just the flu. And I'll show you more evidence for why it's not just the flu in a minute, but certainly it's mortality rate uh, is that. Now this is the, the sort of average mortality rate over the population. If we look with age, we see that as the population of infected people get older, the mortality rate goes up dramatically. These, these data are from three countries uh, earlier in the pandemic, South Korea, Spain, China, and Italy. And you can see that the very young is, was essentially zero in this study. And as we get up in population, 
when we get over 70, we start to see these very high mortality rates, as much as 20% in the 80 plus population, especially in that very tragic outbreak early on in the pandemic. You remember Italy was, uh, oh, yeah. was just having people dropping in the street practically. It was quite bad. Um, so this is a, a way of thinking about it. Here's, here's another look at it that compares uh, influenza, uh, COVID-19, and the original SARS that, as I said, turned out didn't have a, as great a spread. Uh, and you'll see the same thing. As, as populations get older, the, the mort mortality rate goes up. The, the case fatality rate, we sometimes call it, 13.4% uh, for over 80. And compare that to influenza again. Uh, even in our older population, influenza is still below 1%, uh, whereas in the old elderly population, it's up in the 4 to 10% to range. So much a much more fatal infection, especially for the elderly. Now, how is it transmitted? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's initially a respiratory infection. So that means like influenza, like the common cold, like anything that's respiratory, it's growing in the respiratory tract of the person who has the infection. And therefore it's in the exudate of the, of the respiratory tract. When a person sneezes or coughs, um, the, it's, in, it's in their saliva, it's in, uh, in, their, in their mucus that's coming out. So we have droplet transmission. Droplets are the, the larger particles that are coming out. And initially, this is all we were thinking about. And so the social distancing number of, of uh, uh, six feet was based on, on people looking at how droplets come out of people's mouths in stop motion photography. But we realized later that some of the virus is actually transmitted as aerosolized particles. These are very small, uh, droplets, if you will, but particles that are that travel much longer distance. So it makes it air, airborne. And this is especially dangerous in enclosed spaces. So that's why indoor spaces with poor ventilation, this aerosolization will carry the virus all around a room. And there are very well documented spread events indoors, the famous one in the choir in, um, in the church in Washington where the choir was singing and literally everyone in the choir got infected from one person in the choir. Um, now, Marty, I have <clears throat> seen <clears throat> some claims that those droplets typically travel 20 feet and uh, yet uh, our standard for social distancing is six feet. See, Can yes. you help me understand that? Yeah, and I think the issue is that our first defense is masking. Three-layer mask is the first defense that keeps the droplets from leaving the infected person. Yeah. We started with the six-foot one because that was uh, very few virologists wanted to admit that this could be aerosolized initially. Mm -hmm. And there's a historic reason for that, that actually goes way back in, in epidemiology to the early parts of the 20th century, where um, people in science were trying to get away from the idea of infections being uh, bad air, if you will, right? Oh. Remember that piece where, where in the Middle Ages, it was the bad air that was- Well, even, even in the New Testament, we have these archontai, these ah. elemental spirits, Mm -hmm. which travel in the air. And I believe this tradition of when a person sneezes, we say, God bless you, is actually a way of combating mm -hmm. uh, airborne, well, we would call them infections. They didn't have that word. At any rate, yeah, get back to making your point now. I don't want to- well, but, but there was, a, there was an in, kind of inborn, if you will, in the discipline, reluctance to say something was airborne. Yeah. Okay, because of that old history. But we already knew that mumps is airborne. That was one that had been demonstrated. So the droplet thing happened because that's what respiratory epidemiologists would say. The virus is traveling on droplets. And the evidence from, as I said, stop motion photography was that these droplets fall to the ground within six feet. Thus, social distancing was six feet. 
But we now know it's aerosolized. There's a fair number that go. And it explains the transmission in restaurants in enclosed spaces, right. fire transmission in Seattle. So we know it's aerosolized. So the masking is probably more important now than the six feet even. Yeah. Now, the idea of transmitting it by direct or indirect contact was, a, was very big initially. And we ought to wash hands. We ought to make sure that we wash hands. But, but being transmitted by you touching something that someone else has touched is probably a low risk event. Yes, if it was, if you were unlucky enough to uh, have gone into a doorway where the person before you coughed in their hand and opened the door, and then you touched that door and then touched your face, you could get the virus. But but those events are rare. Uh, it's still the case though that if people wish, they can clean up packages when they come home and and all of the things that I think many of us gotten used to do. But we now think that this uh, indirect contact is probably not as big a deal as the wearing masks and keeping away from each other and staying outdoors. Mm -hmm. All right, what does the virus do? It's a respiratory infection to begin with. So it goes into the lungs and it infects the cells in the lungs and begins producing uh, new virus particles. Uh, if it were like just like that, it would be like the common cold or maybe influenza, and it would cause us a fever and body aches and, and a stuffy head and all the rest of the things we're used to, maybe congestion. But this virus uh, does more. Uh, once it gets down into the deep part of the lungs, and it's something that influenza really doesn't do, down into the small alveolar uh, air sacs, uh, it does two things. It starts breaking down those air sacs, but it also sends out signals that recruit immune, immunological um, response to the air sacs that can wind up compromising those air sacs, filling them with mucus as a response. And, and this, of course, depends on the, the person's own immune system. Some people have a better chance of this not happening. Uh, some people with compromised conditions have a, a larger chance of this happening. But when that happens is when the whole, what's called severe acute respiratory distress piece sets in and people ultimately may need to go on to ventilators to be able to get enough oxygen. And it, the, the air sacs themselves are compromised. But then the virus escapes from those air sacs and makes its way around the body it can damage blood vessels, it can damage heart tissue, uh, it can damage the kidneys, it can damage, it, we know that it, you lose sense of smell and taste, and that's because it infects your nervous system, uh, goes up into your olfactory bulb, it can get into the brain and cause seizures. I mean, it is so widespread uh, in its response that uh, it's amazing. Uh, influenza virus does nothing like this. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this widespread multi-organ infection. And again, it's not everyone. This is what happens in what's called severe COVID-19. This sort of breakdown of the immune system, what's called a cytokine storm, uh, organ failure all around uh, that can lead to very, very problematic recovery and in many cases, as we know, death. So it's a very pathogenic uh, invader when the body has risk factors that allow this to happen. In addition, there are these long-term effects that we're only now learning about. Um, people who were experiencing this for a long time had trouble getting doctors to take them seriously. They gave themselves the name long haulers um, to do to, to characterize this. Shortness of breath would continue long after their, um, their infection seemed to be over. Joint pain, um, insomnia, brain fog, this difficulty uh, trying to, to reason. Uh, and we now know that a lot of this uh, is, is actually real, uh, that there, are, there's, there can be permanent heart damage, there can be scarring of lungs, not in everyone, but in enough people to make this worrying. In fact, a number of young people, uh, our daughter-in-law got, got infected in the early part of the pandemic, late March, early April, 
She was very sick for about uh, two, two weeks, two or three weeks, never hospitalized. But it took her forever to recover. I mean, she was only getting back to normal activity in late October, early November. Wow. Really. I mean, she told me one day, I, I find she's a runner. So she was always out doing five mile runs and, and before this. And she finally in October got to do a five mile run without stopping. She was so excited. Mm -hmm. So these long-term effects are real. Uh, and and we're, especially we see them in young people uh, who get the serious form of this. Um, so that brings us to the vaccine story. Uh -huh. and then we'll talk more around the, the theological and ethical issues because a lot of it comes out of the vaccine. And, and our classic uh, vaccines have been, of course, the classic vaccine is the smallpox vaccine that was... Um, fortuitously discovered by Jenner uh, in the late uh, 18th century when stories from people who work, farmers and, and milkmaids who worked with cows uh, would have this common knowledge that if you were infected with cowpox, uh, you'd never get smallpox. And Jenner intuitively thought, well, that, that's interesting and, and started purposely infecting people with cowpox and lo and behold, they were immune uh, to smallpox. And that was our first vaccine. The word vaccinia, of course, comes, vaccine comes from vaca for cow in Latin. Oh, I didn't yeah, know that. That's where that. That's where that word comes from. And the virus that he used came to be known as vaccinia virus. Oh, wow. Virus. So uh, traditionally, we tried to make vaccines by either inactivating the real virus so it no longer could infect or producing a strain of the virus that was live, but, but did not cause the disease. And we, that's what the polio vaccine is, both forms of it. That's what a lot of our early influenza vaccines were. All of those were attempts to use the virus itself. But with increased access to technology, we got better and better at this. And so now we have the very modern versions coming online, which are these two down here, the DNA vaccines, uh, uh, and the mRNA vaccines. This is where the genetic information for this spike protein, which is really what you want to be the to have to be the target of your immune response. You want to train your immune response to recognize this protein on the outer surface of the virus so that when you encounter the virus, you make antibodies which can stick onto the surface here and block or neutralize the virus from being able to infect you. And then you make other kinds of cells that can attack not only the virus particle, but also cells that happen to get infected by it and get rid of those. And so that's, that's your target is that spike protein. Um, and so what we've done in these platforms now is be able to take the genetic information for this spike protein and put it just in a DNA piece or in a simple piece of messenger RNA, RNA that can go into the cell and just be used to make that protein only and nothing else, okay? And these are very modern platform vaccines. And as I said, the idea of a, an mRNA vaccine or, or in the case of the AstraZeneca one, these uh, dead virus particles, basically replication incompetent viruses that have the gene for the, the spike protein. Um, adenovirus in this case. Well, in designing the vaccine, do you um, use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing techniques at all, or is it a different kind of process? It's much simpler than having to use CRISPR-Cas9. It, it was simply getting the genome sequence that the Chinese scientists first provided us yeah. and everything else in the world added to and just taking the sequence of RNA, because this is an RNA virus, yeah. and, and just taking and synthesizing artificially the information for the spike protein. Okay. Putting it into an RNA that's recognized when it gets into the cell by the machinery that makes proteins, Yeah. having the cell make the spike protein. And then that cell is recognized by your immune system uh, and the immune system learns to recognize the spike protein, mm -hmm. but you never, you never have to have the virus in you. Okay. So our first two viruses are these mRNA, our first two vaccines 
are these mRNA platform uh, vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer. Moderna was the one I showed you on, on March 16th, started their trial in, in Seattle and Pfizer was right behind them. Now, just, just to be clear, uh, the, 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 the current administration set up what was called Operation Warp Speed. And, and for everybody who heard that, they thought, oh, they're pushing vaccine development way beyond the safe limits. But Operation Warp Speed was never meant to be pushing the vaccine development. What it was, was to push the delivery of the vaccine to be set up alongside making the vaccine. So the idea is we'll, we'll have these vaccines in clinical trials in the standard way we always do clinical trials, which is a phase one trial with a very small number of people, then a phase two trial, and then a full-blown phase three trial. And while that's going on, the companies would ramp up their production of the vaccine. The normal way would be to wait until the vaccine got approval and then start manufacturing it. So the government basically supplemented Pfizer in one case, no, I'm sorry, Moderna in one case, to be able to make vaccine while waiting for the clinical trials. That's the warp speed part. I, I sat in on all of the um, applications for approval at FDA. Oh. And good. looked at, I, I, I wasn't on the panel, but I was, I was in the audience and read all of the documents. And so both Moderna and Pfizer uh, had interim results that were presented, which showed their vaccines to be 95% efficacious, meaning that uh, when you compare, these were double blind studies. Both studies incorporated something like 40,000 volunteers divided into two groups, 40 to 60,000 volunteers, two groups. One received a placebo, just a saline injection. The other received the vaccine and then you waited. These are two dose vaccines. So you waited until after the second dose. And then you started looking to see who got COVID-19, who became positive for COVID-19. And when a certain number of those cases uh, were accumulated in the study population, it was already in the design that when you got to this number, it would trigger a special panel at NIH, independent of the company, to look to unblind the data and see who got the who got COVID nineteen and who didn't, and that's where the number ninety five percent comes from. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were able to see that the vast majority of COVID nineteen cases were in the placebo group and only a very few in the vaccinated group. And in a study like that, do they deliberately expose uh, both groups? to COVID-19 in order to speed it up or do they let nature take its course? Oh my God, what a great ethical question, Ted. Uh, because actually, no, it's just that you're put by double blind into one or the other group. You don't know what you got and the person giving it to you doesn't know what they gave you. And then you wait and just see who got it. Now, a faster way of doing this would be what's called a challenge study, where you vaccinate people and then challenge them with the actual virus. The ethics of that were debated in uh, October and November. The British actually decided to try that. Yeah. They actually let that go through. We would never do that in this country. Okay, thank you. Our ethical boards would, especially for a virus, with a significant case fatality rate. Right. Now, something like the common cold with no case fatality rate, you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. but, but not with something with significant danger to right. life. In fact, um, in, the, uh, in the Pfizer study, in the, vex, in the control group, lots of people got COVID-19, but nobody died, interestingly. But in the Moderna one, they had one fatality yeah. uh, at, at the two month level. Right. And that person, um, you know, they took their chances, but they would they were not purposely exposed to the virus. In the Pfizer study, did that include Europeans or only uh, North Americans? The Pfizer data was simply in North America. Moderna, let, wait a minute, let me back up a bit. Pfizer had a, 
a, a portion of their data that they used that was European, yes. Okay. Because BNT is a, is a German company, uh, BNTech. Mm -hmm. And so they had some, some study in Germany and some in Brazil. Uh, Moderna was mainly this country. Thank you. As I'm remembering the data. Yeah. Um, so both applied in uh, December for an emergency use authorization that was granted. And those are the two vaccines that are now being delivered. Now, EUA means that it can only be given uh, under the rules laid down by the FDA as to who can and cannot be injected. So for instance, neither of these vaccines can be given to people under the age of 18 because there wasn't enough data in the studies to justify. Oh, uh -huh. There wasn't enough data to justify giving it to pregnant women. So that was another mm -hmm. uh, uh, caveat. Um, and the FDA also came up with this plan we're now seeing of 1A, 1B, <laughs> and one see who, who has priority uh, to be vaccinated. Now, this figure, by the way, just shows you how a messenger RNA vaccine works. You take the informational content of the virus that creates the spike protein. You artificially produce an RNA that's called a messenger RNA that has that information. You package it inside this lipid nanoparticle, which is basically a lot of uh, fatty molecules in tiny particles that allow the particle to bind to the cell surface once it's injected. It's injected intramuscularly. The particle binds and the RNA goes into the cells and the program machinery, a decoding machinery in the cell makes the, the protein and your body then, your immune system then responds. Um, so this is the, this particular diagram is from Pfizer. And so you see tested across two major trials in Europe and the US. Okay. Um, and and, and uh, this is their candidate. This is what, what we're getting. BNT162B2 is the name of the vaccine. And Moderna uh, is the other one that's now approved. So you should know that there, there is no virus included in this vaccine. This is simply a synthetically made messenger RNA. So no one should think that um, you could get sick from this with COVID-19. There's no virus in it. It's just the RNA gene for the spike protein by itself, which causes no disease. Now let me report to you a misbelief out there. And um, <clears throat> I've actually seen it preached from the pulpit as well as um, people involved in um, who are close to the vaccination. And that is the belief that we should not take this virus because it will negatively alter the DNA in our body. Ergo, stay away from these vaccines. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? That is absolutely not possible. Uh, there are a number of reasons. First of all, this RNA only goes into the cytoplasm of the cell, not into the nucleus. Thank you. Yeah. So that's one thing. Yeah. Second thing is people say, well, then it could be converted into DNA. That's what the enzyme reverse transcriptase does. But this RNA is not a substrate. It can't be used by that enzyme to make DNA because it doesn't have the correct signals on it. Uh, and, and finally, there's very little of that enzyme in our cells. Uh, only in very yep. special cells is that enzyme even found. So mm -hmm. in all cases, this RNA, and the RNA has a very limited lifetime in the cell. Yeah. Maybe, maybe by the next day after the injection, it's all gone. Yeah. Very labile molecules. So that can't happen. There's another ethical issue too that's floating around about this vaccine and a lot of other vaccines. And that's the issue of um, there being uh, use of aborted fetuses in the production of the vaccine. Um, and the way it's stated sometimes is that there are pieces, if you will, of a, an aborted fetus that's actually part of the vaccine in some sense or that, that, that kind of idea. 
And there is, there is an issue here in, for some people in that in, in the use, in the testing of the vaccine, you need to grow viruses up so that you can see that they're being inactivated by uh, antibodies in, in testing how the, the immune response works. And one very common cell, cell line that's used is called HEC, H-E-K 293, stands mm -hmm. for Human Embryonic Kidney 293. Uh -huh. And that cell line was derived from a, a legal abortion that was carried out in the 1960s. Uh, and then the cells from the kidney of that aborted uh, embryo yeah. were used in, in laboratories to make a cell line, which is now immortal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in that sense, there's a, a tie back right. to this, this legal abortion in the 1960s. And for some ethicists, especially in the Catholic Church, that remains problematic. Right. So the evil still obtains, if you will, it's from a, the, a poison tree kind of fruit thing. All right. So but today, scientists are not out killing babies. Absolutely not. Absolutely. All right. But more importantly, a very interesting, the, the, the Pope Francis has just stated uh, in the last few days in response to this, that Catholics have a moral obligation to be vaccinated. Good for Pope Francis. He sees it as a yeah. moral obligation to serve the community to be vaccinated uh, and, and, and considers it to be wrong to not accept the vaccine. And so I, I hope that that in fact clears up. I have a- I, the, It uh, does clear it. I, I would think for a Catholic that would clear it right there. I, I hope so. I have a, a, a priest friend here in, who's in, in Albuquerque who has contacted me about this. And, and I hope he's, if, if he hasn't, I will send it to him, the Pope's pronouncement on this. All right, good. Uh, so that, that's another issue that kind of surrounds for, for some who are, especially in the Catholic community, sure. some resistance to this. But in terms of side effects, the vaccine had in, in their application, very normal, I'm gonna call what we expect side effects from vaccination. Um, very few, uh, at no, really no adverse events. The, uh, the exceptional allergic responses we saw were only when it got released to a larger community. And we've seen now in this country, three anaphylactic reactions from people who have exceptional food allergies. And we're thinking it might be one or more of these lipid particles that are in the lipid nanoparticle that might have caused that, but they were all treated easily with an EpiPen, and so nobody was hospitalized from it. Uh, there's no paralysis, like people think about Guillain-Barre or something like that. Uh, virtually no adverse effects. I, I was vaccinated, as I was telling Ted before we started, um, on, uh, on New Year's Eve. Uh, our, our faith community here in Taos was fortunate. Those of us who are volunteers for our churches uh, in food kitchens and the like, were given the opportunity to be vaccinated by our hospital. And so my wife and I went on, on New Year's Eve and got vaccinated. My symptoms were, my arm was a little sore the next day and I felt like I had body aches for a few hours. That was it, pretty much it. That was my dose one. I have to go for dose two uh, next week. Uh, this is the, the other vac vector platform that AstraZeneca is now distributing in the UK. Same idea, you give the cell the gene. In this case, instead of delivering the gene as a nanoparticle of RNA, it delivers the gene in a, a, a modified adenovirus as a DNA. And once it gets inside the cell, it makes the spike protein, very simple. Uh, same idea, in other words, you don't get you don't get SARS virus or COVID nineteen related virus. You get this this inactivated replication incompetent adenovirus. Uh, we may see that one in this country within the next um, uh, as of this this time we're talking Ted early January. We might see this one by mid mid February maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been given approval by FDA yet. Yeah. So one of the big questions is how good is the vaccination? 
How long will it last? And okay. people ask me, will this last for years? And my answer is, we've only known about these fires for 10 months. How could I tell you your vaccination is gonna last for years? So we're gathering results. And, and here are some results from, uh, from a study. And this one was interesting. This was published in Science. I mean, in, in New England Journal in, in, in early December. Remember the, the, the date 316, I said, when the yes. Moderna phase one trial started yes. in Seattle? Well, that, that trial was actually just to see if there were any adverse effects. It wasn't about measuring immune response. But they had about 40 or 50 people in the study. So they decided to continue to take blood from them and, and sample them over time. And, and so this was a publication that said, this is them out uh, about six or seven months. And these graphs all show what, what you're looking at is the level of antibody yeah. that they, they're displaying. And you can see that even in the older age groups, this is the, this is the age group over 71, even out in eight, six to eight months, there's still plenty of antibody being made in these few subjects. There's a very similar result that was just published three days, three or four days ago in Science with uh, many more people uh, that were vaccinated. So we're, we're confident that the, what's called the durability of the vaccine response yeah. will, be, will be good. And, and part of the issue is most people, are look, most people are thinking about the antibody levels like this. That's not really the heart of your immune system. The heart of it are what are called memory cells. Uh, once you, you have an immune response to an antigen uh, of a vaccination, not only do you make antibody, but your, your body very wisely sets aside sets of cells that can make those antibodies. And they're called memory cells. Mm -hmm. And they're put in different places around your body. So what happens when you now encounter the real virus, rather than having to wait for several days until your immune system gets itself ready to do everything. In, in a matter of hours, you're making antibody from these memory cells. Uh, and that's really the heart of the, of the immune response. And, and people are looking at memory cells after vaccination now. There's actually a, a seminar tomorrow I'm gonna try to sit in on that's about that, about memory T cells. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm confident of, of the durability here. Whether we're going to need uh, boosters every year or, or, or whether the, vi the virus is going to eventually mutate to be resistant to the vaccination, which could happen. Viruses mutate. Those current mutations we're seeing in the UK um, are not resistant to the vac vaccine. Right. We've, we've learned that. Yeah. Uh, but eventually over years, it may, it may change, in mm -hmm. which case we'll simply make a new vaccine and everybody will, yeah. just as we get our annual flu shots, uh, get another coronavirus vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's my last slide. Well, um, thank you. I got an enormous uh, education uh, from that, I'd like to have you speculate a little bit now as a philosopher and a theologian, in addition to um, <clears throat> being, a, um, being a scientist. And um, I've got questions about God and human nature. Are you ready? Um, some th a hard one first, Ted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Kind of Gunter Thomas uh, in Germany, one of the few theologians who tried to weigh in on this, or also Arvind Gao, and I think you might know Arvind's work. No, I know Arvind, yes. Yeah. They raised the theodicy question, which mm -hmm. I think is reasonable um, to ask. Uh, do you have any thoughts <laughs> about the theodicy question in relationship uh, to this pandemic? Uh, did God send coronavirus to punish the human race for something we did wrong? Wow, there's so many ways you could take that. So, so one, one way is to say a, a lot of these spillover events that lead to zoonotic disease are, are actually the result of human behavior, okay? 
um, either human encroachment into ecological areas where these animals exist and have never been in contact with humans before. Yeah. That's certainly how we think AIDS, uh, HIV jumped from chimpanzees to humans or uh, hunting animals in those, uh, in those regions that, that then bring us into contact with these viruses. And again, viruses that jump from the bat to the human through another animal. So in, in some sense, zoonotic uh, disease could be looked at as the result of human behavior uh, and choices that people make, those wet markets in China. Yeah. It's almost impossible to get people to swear off those, even though we know they're the source. Right. Two outbreaks now, SARS-1 and SARS-2. Um, and, and so in a sense, there is a component there of culpability, if you will, uh, ethical culpability, you might say, to the behavior of our species to do these things. So right. is that then translatable into the idea of God uh, imposing a punishment? I think I'd, I'd have to be that kind of theologian that believes that God actually punishes us, uh, which is not not my sort of Thomistic take on it. I, yeah. Uh, that that uh, we don't we don't get punished in that same sense, but certainly there is an idea that human behavior has something to do with this. Right. The the other take I have on it is that is the virus itself an evil? Okay. Is this can can you consider it a natural evil? Right. Okay. Well, well, well a natural evil like a hurricane that kills thousands of people, almost everybody on an island. Yeah. Um, is it like that? No, be because this virus in particular doesn't kill that many people. Mm -hmm. If you think of the population as a whole, yeah, we're not all in danger of dying. And in fact, we have good ways of avoiding it as we've been talking about. Yeah. Um, so it, it isn't of the kind of evil that you'd say is a, a landslide that wipes out a village. Um, but it is, uh, in some sense, an agent that, that harms us. And so if, if taking away one human life is in fact considered to be an evil, the value of the human life, in other words, that, that one life that's lost, and now we've lost approaching 400,000 in this country from this disease, it certainly is a natural evil. In, in the in the in the population yeah. societal sense of it, right. So um, I, it's hard for me to stand back from it. Uh, as sometimes as a virologist, where it so fascinates me to look at how it works, and and see this new thing, this new glittery object, you know, in my field that right. everybody's focused on, and step back and and Gail keeps me focused. My wife, everybody that Ted knows very well. Because Gail reads the the epidemiology numbers to me every night. <laughs> you are up to date. <laughs> the number of cases in the country is now yeah. over 12 million. Right. And our total deaths is now over 340 million, 340,000. And in the state of New Mexico, we've lost this many people. So it's my my evening um, orientation, if you will, to the reality of this. It's not just a virus that I can look yeah. at. And, oh, isn't that neat? This is a real thing. And so ethically and theologically, I think, especially, I, I need to confront it as a as, as what it is, an, an, an object lesson for us as humans, whether yeah. God is there or not, it exists. Right. And how we respond to it has been instructive. Well, speaking of how we respond to it, it leads me to my next question of theological anthropology. And this is, I don't have the answer to this, but it besets me with consternation. And that is how, in America at least, people have responded to this threat. Mm -hmm. I understand that you and Gail and Karen, my wife, and I, we get into the bubble and we sort of try to protect ourselves and we ask our families and loved ones, please protect yourselves. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole segment of the population that says no to that. We're going to throw our parties and we're going to demand that other people take off their masks. That, 
And uh, when they do this, the number of emergency cases in the hospital skyrockets. Marty, could you explain human nature to me? I don't quite get it. Okay. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> I, I've seen it. I've seen it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the short answer, no. Oh, oh all right. I'm afraid I can't. I, 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 I am stunned, as you are, by the by the the need for people to uh, to do that, and it and it varies it, culturally. It certainly does. I mean, we've seen other countries like New Zealand, uh, where everybody just pulled together, right? And and they eventually Taiwan, I think, as well, yeah, yeah pulled together and stopped it. Right. And we we insist on uh, we as a, a culture insist on having this freewheeling kind of everybody do their own thing attitude that flies in the face of the of the love your neighbor as you would love yourself rule. Right. Uh, if if I know that my action can not hurt me necessarily, I may be asymptomatic. I may be able to go to a bar and drink all night and wind up with the virus and never even have a symptom. In my son's case, his family, my daughter-in-law was sick. The cough from hell, we called it. Yeah. Uh, my uh, oldest grandson had the sniffles, the other grandson and our son, not a symptom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if, you, if you're that way, you can say, well, it's not going to kill me. I'm, I'm going to be yeah. fine. And you may be. But what about the person in the grocery store that you sneezed around right. who's 80 years old and, and is using a walker and winds up dying a, a week later? No. There, there is a caring that we're supposed to have as a society. That's not just Christian. It's, it's way beyond simply the Christian value of Jesus's message. To me, it's, it's really universal. In the paper I wrote for Theology and Science, when I talked about vaccination, uh, I, I made that point that this is not just the, the Jesus statement of love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Yeah. The golden rule that everybody kind of holds up, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And why that doesn't permeate what is supposed to be a country of Christians, quote unquote. Yeah, all right. Uh, I, I can't figure out. I can't figure out. No, uh, I, I can't either. And speaking about ethics, one of the um, <clears throat> contributions, the special contributions of the Roman Catholic bioethicists over the last three or four decades has been an emphasis on the common good. And uh, clearly this is a period of time in which the common good makes sense. <laughs> it really makes sense. Uh, and uh, because it makes so much sense, I, I have to say I'm befuddled uh, by the uh, wanton and dangerous behavior of our large segments of our uh, society. Um, when the alternative is relatively easy, we've got good advice from Dr. Fauci and Francis Collins and uh, people like that. Uh, good advice. And you know what? <laughs> it just doesn't and, happen. I just and unfortunately it became political in the midst of all that. Yeah, uh, which is the last thing we needed to make it be a badge of your your party affiliation almost. And uh, yeah. and, that's bad. and 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 you're right. It it isn't a political issue. It's just good solid public health practice. Right. You can stop the spread. Uh, by doing this. And, and if you don't do it, everybody traveled at Thanksgiving. Yeah. It went up. And now we're starting to go up again in New Mexico because of the Christmas travel. Yeah, I'm afraid. Um, yep, we're going to see it. And well, so, I'm kind of um, uh, ready to wind down, uh, Marty. This has been uh, excellent. And even though I've heard you on this before, I learned a, uh, learned a great deal. Do you have any last words last words oof <laughs> <laughs> please, uh, please point omega <laughs> we please consider accepting the vaccination when it becomes available to you those who are listening to this i understand from ted we may be three or four weeks from now before i'm i'm you're hearing me say this 
And by then I'm hoping that vaccines will be widely available to people. Please consider that. Uh, it's, what will, it's what will get us out of this particular pandemic uh, and back to what we, we, we want to call our normal life uh, very quickly. If we get enough percentage, I didn't mention herd effect. Uh, the, the idea that you have to have a certain percent of the population vaccinated or immune in some way to stop the spread of the virus. And, and please consider that seriously. I know there, there may be some listening to me. I certainly have students who are, who are reluctant for a variety of reasons. They're always worried about their, health, their own health and their, their family's health, and they rightfully so. But, but um, look at the data, see if you believe that it's safe for you and consider that. And the other thing I would ask is that we've been through so much in this year um, and some things have changed for us in our lives in ways that uh, we'll never forget. Uh, but there's things that have changed that might be worth keeping an eye on. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are better ways of doing things than we thought before. So is there anything that comes out of this pandemic period of um, monkish isolation that we've all been in? Although I have to say this house that is nothing like a monk cell, you know it, uh, <laughs> but that, that we can take forward in our lives and say, maybe, maybe we've learned something from this as a, as a, as a culture. I'm looking for that. All right. Well, thanks a million. And bye. Thank, -bye. You. Thank you, Ted. Bye-bye to everybody. My best to Karen. Okay. And to Gail. Thank you.